Hello there, it's Eric Erickson here, the second hour of the Eric Erickson Show. Glad you're with me. The phone number, 877-973-7425. If you would like to be a part of this year program, you're more than welcome to. In fact, I want to start with a phone call. Out of the gate, Tim, I'm going to go to you up next. Welcome. Hey, Eric, how are you? I'm good. How about yourself? Doing good. Listening to you in the first hour, talking about the freedom of speech and the First Amendment. Uh, now, it applies to government, but not so much private enterprise. But with the schools itself receiving government funding, do they fall under the entitlement or uh, the yes. First Amendment? They, they do. Uh, public schools, public universities uh, fall under the First Amendment. Um, now, you should know that there's a, a history of Supreme Court cases that restrict to a degree the First Amendment in elementary and secondary schools, but generally uh, no restrictions in, um, in uh, higher education. So, for example, um, a, a student on a campus of a public university should be able to protest, should be able to speak their mind, uh, and should be able to do so without fear of punishment or anything. Uh, and as, as a result, uh, the Supreme Court has taken a really, really tough standard on universities that try to restrict their speech. Now, at the secondary level, uh, that's high school level, there are more restrictions that can be imposed. However, uh, the Supreme Court in the past has said that you can't force teachers to violate their conscience, which is something uh, David French or the dispatch has said is probably going to help the teacher in Kansas who doesn't want to call the boy uh, with, he doesn't want to use female pronouns to address a boy in her class. The boy claims he's transitioning. Uh, that should be able to help that. At elementary levels, however, there are um, real restrictions on the First Amendment the Supreme Court has found and how you say things and what you say. Uh, at an elementary school level, given the sensitivities there. So there there are graduated standards within education for the First Amendment. And as a general rule of thumb, though, uh, once you reach uh, the capacity of an adult, which is college, uh, you get the full-on First Amendment even in education settings. Now, I want I, I didn't want to leave Tim on, on hold talking about that for the first hour. I do want to move on to something else. And to, to set the stage here, I got to play you a clip. Here's what you need to remember about the history of Ronald Reagan getting elected. It wasn't a sure thing. In fact, if you go to the Republican primary in 1980, uh, the entirety of the Republican establishment seemed aligned against Ronald Reagan. Um, you had everybody and their mother come out to try to run against Ronald Reagan in the Republican primary. You had every major member of the establishment, some, some very familiar names, uh, for Americans out there. Frankly, you had, uh, the Republican party in 1980 had, uh, George Bush, who had been the director of the central intelligence committee. John Anderson, who is a congressman from Illinois, who actually uh, dropped out and ran as an independent, and his whole campaign was stop Ronald Reagan. Howard Baker had been the uh, Senate Republican leader. In fact, he stayed in the Senate until uh, 1985. Phil Crane, also a Republican from Illinois. John Connolly, been the Secretary of the Treasury, and was from Texas. Harold Strayson was the director of the U.S. Foreign Operations Administration, and Bob Dole, senator from Kansas. Now, you also had Larry Pressler from South Dakota and Lowell Weicker from Connecticut, two liberal Republicans uh, who dropped out. Uh, and there were a lot of others. They were trying to get uh, Gerald Ford to run. They were trying to get Pete DuPont to run, trying to get a number of other people to run, all of it to stop Ronald Reagan. And you need to understand, in 1980... The entirety of the Republican establishment ran to stop Ronald Reagan, and it had uh, a familiar theme. It, it got Reagan elected because the moderates in the establishment could not decide, do we want Baker? Do we want Bush? Do we want Dole? Do we want Anderson? And Reagan was able to galvanize and consolidate the conservatives, and then he picked George Bush. George Bush won several primaries. He won the Connecticut primary, the D.C. primary, the Iowa caucus, uh, Maine, Massachusetts, Michigan, Pennsylvania, even Puerto Rico. 
and he got 3 million votes. And he was the guy who was supposed to stop Ronald Reagan. What happened is he became Ronald Reagan's vice president. And his team hoped, given his experience in Washington, he had been the chairman of the Republican Party. He had uh, been the director of central intelligence. He had been the ambassador to China. He had intimate working knowledge of Washington being a congressman that they would be able to co-opt Reagan. If anything, when George H.W. Bush ran for office in 1988, it was viewed as Ronald Reagan's third term. And when he came out as himself, people realized he was no Reagan and he lost in 92, having broken his promise on taxes. All of this is to say that uh, Ronald Reagan's election in 1980 was not a sure thing. Uh, Ronald Reagan managed to beat Jimmy Carter pretty decisively. 489 electoral college votes for Ronald Reagan, 49 for Jimmy Carter. None for John Anderson, who ran as the Stop Reagan Independent. Jimmy Carter won Minnesota, Georgia, West Virginia, Maryland, the District of Columbia, and Rhode Island. Can you imagine that? They called it, it back in the day, you know, the red states and the blue states. Uh, the red states were always given to the challenger and the blue states to the incumbent. So in 1980, Ronald Reagan was the challenger, so he had the red states, and it was the Reagan bloodbath. In 1984, Walter Mondale, who had been Jimmy Carter's vice president, ran uh, and lost to Reagan. Reagan won every state except Minnesota and the District of Columbia, and it was called the Reagan Swimming Pool because it was all blue for Reagan being the incumbent. In 2000, George W. Bush was the challenger. In 2000, became such a seminal election. Uh, it tied Republicans to the red states and Democrats to the blue states, given what happened. I wish we'd go back to the incumbent always being the blue state and flip it back and forth, but it gave so much meaning, and the media now had a narrative to describe the country, red versus blue, that they've changed it. But it was no sure thing. It was a, it was a wipeout. You should know it was a wipeout. It was a stunning wipeout for Jimmy Carter, but it was not actually the case that people thought it was going to be the blowout. In fact, when you look at the polling trends, it was really close for a long time. It was pretty close up until towards the end. Reagan and Carter had a series of debates. And Reagan uttered a very famous line in one of the closing debates. In fact, it was the closing debate in 1980, and it really began to seal the deal. Keep in mind, there wasn't a major absentee voting. There was no early voting. It was election day voting. And so you could have these debates at the end of a presidential race, and they could fundamentally, dramatically shake things up. And Reagan's closing, the October 28th, 1980 debate, sealed the deal, and it has become a question that every person running for president asks about the incumbent. Next Tuesday, all of you will go to the polls who stand there in the polling place and make a decision. I think when you make that decision, it might be well if you would ask yourself, are you better off than you were four years ago? Is it easier for you to go and buy things in the stores than it was four years ago? Is there more or less unemployment in the country than there was four years ago? Is America as respected throughout the world as it was? Do you feel that our security is as safe, that we're as strong as we were four years ago? And if you answer all of those questions, yes, why then I think your choice is very obvious as to who you'll vote for. If you don't agree, if you don't think that this course that we've been on for the last four years is what you would like to see us follow for the next four, then I could suggest another choice that you have. Are you better off today than you were four years ago? It is now a question that helped Ronald Reagan win in a landslide. And it is a question people are starting to ask now. We're not even four years into the Biden administration. Uh, tip polling. The INI tip poll is out. Are you better off today than a year ago? 
by four to one, Americans say no. This is Issues and Insights, I and I, a uh, tip poll. The poll asked, generally speaking, is your family better off today than it was a year ago? Worse off than it was a year ago or about the same? Fewer than one in five say they're better off, while most, more than twice that number, 42% say they're worse off, 36% say about the same. Taken as a whole, that means 78% of Americans have seen no progress or improvement at all in their financial and economic lives since Biden took office in early 20, in, in 2021. Despite this, Biden's recent speeches have included references to the best economic growth in the last four years, in four decades. We did it alone without one single solitary Republican vote, he said in Philadelphia, March 11th, speaking to House Democrats. It was the Democrats. It was you that brought us back. If that's the message, Americans aren't buying it. And a big reason for that is likely the sudden scary surge in inflation, which hits low and middle income Americans hardest of all. While wage gains have averaged 5% or higher for four straight months, unfortunately, inflation to the same periods has surged to a rate of over 7% and looks likely to go even higher. Americans, it seems, are feeling the pinch of Bidenomics. They can't keep up despite all the stimulus or perhaps because of it. In the same poll, uh, I and I tip asked Americans, how much does your household have in emergency savings? That is money that is readily available in either a checking or savings or money market account. By 56% of all Americans say they have no savings or barely enough to last two months should there be economic trouble. Only 16% of respondents said they had financial resources for three to five months, and just 16% said they had stashed enough for six months. 11% weren't sure. People are on hard times, and we're only a year into the Biden administration. Now there's this. This is from CBS News. Would-be home buyers may be forced to rent the American dream rather than buy it. Every American is feeling the bite of inflation. Groceries cost more. Gas costs are up. Everything seems to cost more. This past week, the Federal Reserve raised interest rates in an effort to tame the highest inflation in 40 years. The cost of rent is really through the roof. Residential rents across the country went up an average of 15% last year, nearly twice the overall inflation rate. That's particularly painful for tenants because they now often have to spend as much as half their total income on rent. Why are rents rising so much? Well, it turns out big Wall Street firms are playing a role, but we found the fundamental problem was years in the making and will take years to fix. There's not enough housing in America. You know, we're not alone. Uh, we got offered cash for our house way more than the value of our house. We couldn't take it. There's literally nowhere for us to move. I mean, it was it was great, sight unseen. They wanted a whole lot more money than, than what we owe on the house. Well, there's no house for us to move to. That's comparable in size. There's nothing. And we don't have a huge house. But there's nothing near in our price range, anywhere where we would want to live. And more and more Americans who like the American dream, who want to invest in the American dream, they can't. They got to rent. And renting does not build you equity. And if anything, as rents keep going up, it's going to cost Americans. And at some point, we're going to have a real crisis in this country when Americans who typically have been able to buy houses and build equity through their houses no longer have that option. It's going to hurt bad. Are you better off than you were four years ago? No, you're not. Are you better off than you were a year ago? You're really not. The question Ronald Reagan asked in 1980 is going to be the question Republicans are asking as people go to the polls in November. And it is going to be doom and gloom for Democrats. And Joe Biden doesn't help by being out there trying to take credit for all the supposed great economic growth we're seeing in the country when nobody's feeling it. Hello there. Welcome back. The phone number is 877-973-7425. Glad to have you with me. Well, the UN Secretary General, you know, when I was a kid, part of this was I, I grew up overseas. And when I was a kid growing up overseas, you kind of knew who the UN Secretary General was. The time growing up as a kid is Boutros Boutros Ghali. And for a while there, there was Kofi Annan. I, I've lost track of, of who the UN Secretary General is. Apparently, his name is Antonio Guterres. And he says, the science is clear, so is the math. It, it's, it's the climate goals are on life support. This from the Washington Post, there's no kind way to put it. 
The Secretary General told attendees of the Economist Sustainability Summit, saying in prepared remarks that the most ambitious goal of the 2015 Paris Accord to limit Earth's warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius above pre-industrial levels is slipping away. The 1.5 degree goal is on life support. It's in intensive care. Gutierrez said the scientific implications of climate change are clear, and so is the math. To have a chance of avoiding global warming's most ruinous impacts, the world must cut greenhouse gas pollution nearly in half by 2030 and erase its carbon footprint entirely by mid-century. But that aspiration remains far from reality as global emissions rise and national climate commitments lack the ambition that scientists say is necessary to abandon the age of fossil fuels as rapidly as possible. Really? We're going to go through this in the middle of a war in Ukraine when gas prices are through the roof? The obsession with this. You have a bunch of people who believe we are in existential crisis on the verge of annihilation. And it is simply not true. It is an arbitrary figure, 1.5 degrees Celsius. That's 2.7 degrees Fahrenheit. And it is preposterous to think that we will get there because China itself is one of the leading culprits. And no one at the United Nations wants to hold China accountable. American emissions are down. Nobody wants to, to call out China, though. In the United States, this from the Washington Post, as Europe and its allies seek to curtail their reliance on Russian oil and gas, they must continue to prioritize the transition to clean energy instead of locking in new fossil fuel infrastructure for decades to come, according to the U.N. Secretary General. In the United States, where President Biden has pledged to cut the nation's emissions at least in half by 2030, greenhouse gas emissions surged last year. Democrats on Capitol Hill have so far failed to revive the climate provisions of a roughly $2 trillion package that includes about $300 billion of tax credits for wind, solar, and nuclear energy producers. While Biden has taken numerous executive actions to try to nudge the nation towards a greener future, his ambitious climate goals and promises send billions annually in climate financing to vulnerable nations are unlikely to succeed without Congress. And Congress isn't going to do it. This is an issue most people do not care about, but the world's elite are obsessed with it. And the world's elite do themselves not be act like they think it's a real problem. Jotting here and there on private planes, they're not using Zoom. If they want to lower their carbon footprint, they could be using Zoom for this stuff, but they're not. They're flying all over the world on their private jets to lecture people on not doing what they want them to do. And no one's doing it and no one will because no one's going to call out China. And unless China's going to, and by the way, the Chinese all the time say, oh, we're doing it, we're doing it, we're doing it. But the actual emissions prove they're not. And they become obsessed. At some point, people are going to start acting very badly when they believe we're in an existential crisis where we're all going to die in the next 10 years and nobody's doing anything to stop it. People will take this matter into their own hands because the shrill rhetoric of the left on environmentalism is going to cause some insane people to act malevolently. Just watch. It's going to happen, and the left will cover it up and apologize for it as people misguided but doing necessary things, undoubtedly. Hello there. It is Eric Erickson here. Glad to have you with me. The phone number, if you want to be on the program, 877-973-7425. Well, I warned you about this, and it is coming to fruition, I'm afraid. You don't like to be right about this sort of stuff, but it's happening. Uh, this is from the Financial Times. Russia's invasion of Ukraine has made life even harder for Fadia Hama, a Lebanese university instructor who was already struggling to make ends meet in a country with a failing economy. Since the start of March, flour has disappeared from the shops and the price of bread has increased by 70%. Supermarkets are hoarding basic goods, then selling them at a higher price, says Hama. Even before the Ukraine crisis, Lebanon was in the grip of a financial meltdown. Its currency has lost more than 90% of its value since 2019. With more than 70% of its wheat imports coming from Ukraine, consumers have been dealt a further blow. 
Hamo's monthly salary has plunged from the equivalent of $1,500 to a paltry $200, now faces the additional burden of high bread prices and shortages of basic foods. Every time I go to buy things for the family, I get depressed. We have to cut down on so many things, she said. The situation in Lebanon may be more precarious than elsewhere in the Arab world because of its economic crisis, but across the region, grains and vegetable oil from Ukraine and Russia are crucial to national diets, and the war has stoked anxiety about food security and political stability. That was from the Financial Times. This is from the Wall Street Journal. Ukrainian farmer Igor Borisov has 2,000 metric tons of corn from the fall harvest stuck in a warehouse behind Russian battle lines. Like other farmers across Ukraine, his crop for this year is also imperiled. Global concerns that Russia's invasion would curtail Ukraine's 2022 harvest have come to fruition. The crop shortfall will extend to many countries that rely on Ukraine for wheat, corn, and cooking oil. With wheat already in the ground, and only a few weeks left to plant corn, farmers in Ukraine can't get needed fertilizers and chemicals. They're low on fuel for tractors and other farm equipment. Workers are quitting to join the fight or to leave the country, leaving farms shorthanded. Mr. Borisov said he and other farmers need to start their corn, sunflower, and barley crops in April and May. That is now in doubt, and the impact on food supplies and prices will be felt worldwide. We hope we will plant, and we want to plant, But the situation is totally unpredictable. You cannot build a forecast on Vladimir Putin, he says. This is going to have worldwide problems. And our country will be impacted along with other countries. Ours will be mitigated to a degree in that we produce enough food in this country to take care of our own. But we export a lot. And those export prices, farmers will be tempted to divert some domestic crop to exports. And that will cause prices to go up. We are going to be in the midst of some problems for the next year because of this situation. It's not really a good situation. And unless this war wraps up soon, it's going to expand. And it doesn't look like the war is going to wrap up anytime soon. The Russians are relying on missiles and artillery to pressure Ukraine. They're essentially uh, blowing up indiscriminately places across uh, Ukraine, hoping to pressure the Ukrainians. Uh, The Ukrainians have refused to abandon Moripol. Moripol is a coastal city. To get to Odessa, which is a big uh, Ukrainian port, the Russians have to go through Moripol. They haven't been able to win it, So they're essentially bombing the snot out of it. I'm sorry, that's Mikolaev is the one they're bombing the snot out of. Moripol is in the east, and they're having a real hard time taking it. Uh, It is a position that they should be able to take on the coast, but the Ukrainians are refusing to give it up. It's in territory that technically... The Russians should control, and the Ukrainians are not abandoning their city. Uh, to the west of the country, in Mykolaiv, the they've been able to, to push the Russians back. The Russians thought they could get it, and they can't. And so this means the Russians will be going to plan B. I don't want to bore you guys about the Ukraine situation, but I, I it, it's important. Uh, we're not just talk. We do news talk, and this is the newsiest story right now. Uh, beyond the the Katanji Brown Jackson stuff, uh, there is a tactical shift that the Russians are deploying now in Ukraine, and you need to understand this because it's going to shape uh, the process forward. Now. What is the process? Well, the Ukrainians have been uh, decimating Russian tanks. In fact, there's a report out today, an American intelligence report out today, that the Russians can get 60% of their air power into the air, which means the Ukrainians have taken out 40% of Russian air power. They have crippled Russian supply lines, and in Belarus... Uh, A group of people in Belarus, they don't know who, are sabotaging train lines that run down to Ukraine so the uh, Russians cannot get ammunition down there. 
the Belarusians thought they would be able to control supply lines on behalf of Russia, and instead saboteurs in Belarus are sabotaging Russian supply lines. It's making it far more difficult. Uh, there are continued murmurs within Russia that things back home are starting to become more difficult for Vladimir Putin such that uh, he may be secretly deposed. The Ukrainians are being um, supplied, and the Russians have been unable to close off those lines. It's going to be interesting to see how much longer the Ukrainians can hold off the Russians, and this gets me to Plan B. Plan B for Russia is to just bomb the snot out of Ukraine. It's not sexy. It's not to make strategic gains. See, the Russians thought they could blitzkrieg Ukraine and take over the country within a couple of days. That intelligence was clearly wrong. Uh, The individuals who put forward that intelligence to Vladimir Putin are now in jail. Putin has arrested a couple of people in the military. He's arrested the head of the FSB. That's the uh, Russian security agency successor to the KGB. And now he's he's, uh, arresting others as well. And the key issue here is that uh, he is trying to find a fall guy to blame for a war that did not go the way he thought it would go. He really thought the Russians really believed they could get into Ukraine and very quickly take it over, and they can't. As an aside here, just random aside, not really a random aside, it's directly relevant. Guy, I've seen several people uh, point this out, and I think it's worth it. Um, morale. Morale matters. There's a lesson for corporate America. You know, in corporations, when morale gets low, companies can go under because employees start bailing. They're not giving their all to the company anymore. That they're, they're, they're not happy. Corporate morale is something that uh, cannot really be, it can't be artificial. It's not artificial. You talk to people in companies and the companies start to fail and the people have no purpose. The company starts going under. uh, Morale matters. You know, being in in the radio industry, I I work for a great company. There are a lot of other companies out there in the radio industry, though, that they're they're not making a profit, and the churn of employees is extensive. Morale gets down, and they're not nearly as profitable as they could be if they were willing to pay their employees a little more and keep the employees happy, and the employees felt like they were investments in the company and not just cogs in a wheel. They could probably turn some of these companies around, but they're not going to. You see this in companies around the world. Companies that treat employees as automatons that are there for the company. The company's not there for them. And meanwhile, the corollary here is in Silicon Valley where they treat all of the employees as princes and kings. And then the employees are so selfish and spoiled when they cut back laundry service, the employees threaten to quit. All my morale's down. Yeah, whatever. I have no sympathy for you people. But morale matters tremendously. My gosh, morale matters. If an employee morale sucks, the company is probably not worth working for. And now the morale of a country. The morale of the Ukrainians has been great. In fact, it's the Russians who are literally seeing their soldiers flee the battlefield into the woods because they don't have the morale. They really thought they were going on a training exercise. They didn't actually think they were going to invade Ukraine. So they've gone into Ukraine. They realize, oh, my gosh, we're actually at war. I didn't sign up for this. Some of them have even shot themselves, allegedly, according to reports. Now, I'm trying to weed out the the propaganda campaigns here, but the actual press reports, you have Russian soldiers wounding themselves to get out of the fight or running off into the woods to get out of the fight. The Ukrainians are able to push back Russian insurgency efforts with counterinsurgency efforts. Take Mikolaev down there uh, in the uh, the Bug River. Yeah, the Bug River, that's the actual name. You have to get through there to get to Odessa. Odessa is an important part, port city. The Russians have been bombing it from ship, but they got to get there with the army. To get there, they got to go through Mikolaev. And the locals in Mikolaev, the farmers, they dug up all the streets, so the Russians only had one path to go through. The Russians came through, and the, the farmers... 
and the volunteers of the professional military wiped out the Russian troops. We're able to push back the Russian lines because the Ukrainians are fighting for something. They're fighting for home. They're fighting for independence. I heard a woman weeks ago say the last two times that the Russians overtook Ukraine, millions of Ukrainians died. They have no choice but to fight. The stakes are high. They know it. They have morale. The Russians have no morale. The Russians have no excitement. The Russians have no desire to be there other than what Vladimir Putin has told them. Some of them are there for money, and that's it. If the Ukrainian morale remains high, it's amazing how powerful morale can be. You know, the mind is a very powerful thing. You hear stories all the time about people and the the power of positive thinking, and, and people are able to cure themselves of illness just by staying positive. Positivity matters. The mind matters. Psychosomatic uh, issues, uh, placebo effect, things like that. The mind has a miraculous power to heal. The mind is a powerful tool. And the Russians are in despair. And that has led the Russians to Plan B. And Plan B will go on until either Vladimir Putin is killed or Ukraine gives up. Plan B is simply to bomb the snot out of Ukraine, to drive Ukrainians to despair, to starve them, to kill them, to bomb them, to punish them. This is what Plan B is. And the Russians will rely on missiles and airstrikes and artillery battery units, and the Ukrainians will have to do whatever they can to push them back, push the Russians back. The Russians can't secure the supply route from Poland into Ukraine. So the Ukrainians are going to continue to be armed, and the Russians are going to be as ruthless as they possibly can. You're going to start hearing all sorts of horror stories, worse than the stories we've already heard. We've heard some bad stories. We're going to hear even more. Uh, And the Russians have no way out of this. People are trying to come up with a way to give Vladimir Putin something. And even the Ukraine's president, Zelensky, is, is beginning to think, it seems from reports, that maybe he does need to give up uh, the Donetsk region and and Crimea, tell Russia you can have them if you get out of the rest of the country. The Russians, though, they got to find a path out of this, short of killing Putin, which they may wind up doing. There, There are more and more murmurs in Russia that the situation there is becoming destabilized. But there's not a lot of good here right now. The problem is it's going to have a spillover effect on the planet because so many people in the world outside of the Western Hemisphere, rely on Ukraine and Russia for wheat, and neither side can grow much right now because they're in a war. This is going to have catastrophic effects. And the Ukrainians are about to see their cities reduced to ash by the Russians just so Vladimir Putin can hopefully demoralize the Ukrainians. Keep them in your prayers, folks. It's going to be worse than what we've already seen. Now, If the air in your home is worse than what you've ever seen or smelled, you might need to try an Eden Pure Thunderstorm. It can eliminate odors in your house. It doesn't just mask the odors. It eliminates the odors. It also gets rid of the mildew, the mold, the bacteria, the pollen that's floating in your house. What you do is you go to EdenPureDeals.com, EdenPureDeals.com, and you use my discount code, ERIC3, E-R-I-C-K-3, and you will get three Eden Pure Thunderstorms for less than $200. You'll get them with savings of $200, and you'll get free shipping. You go to EdenPureDeals.com, the Eden Pure Thunderstorm. It's a filterless air purifier. You just wipe it out on occasion, gets rid of the mildew, the mold, the bacteria, the pollen, and it eliminates odors, doesn't mask the odors. This isn't an essential oil. It actually essentially wipes out the odors in your house. I use it when I travel for hotel rooms and cars. You can too. You get three of them for less than $200. EdenPureDeals.com. The discount code is Eric, E-R-I-C-K, three. This other program brought to you by First Liberty Building and Loan. Wherever you are nationwide, they can help your business grow. If you need access to loans, $750,000 or higher, reach out to First Liberty. They can help you get to yes where banks are saying no. Go to firstlibertyga.com, get their contact info, spend 10 minutes with them, see if they're a good fit for you. Tell them I send you, firstlibertyga.com. Well, uh, I'm interested in this one, even if some of you are not. It looks like the Indianapolis Colts and the Atlanta Falcons may be talking about sending Matt Ryan, the Falcons quarterback, to the Colts. I nearly ran into him the other day. Um, could, <laughs> and like Very literally, he was jogging down the street, and I 
happened to come around the corner and, and bumped into him. Um, <laughs> small world in Buckhead. Um, but it, it appears that the, the, the Colts want Matt Ryan uh, to save them from themselves, and, and Atlanta uh, needs to do something. Uh, Matt Ryan, he's a, he's a fine quarterback, but, man, I'm just – it, something needs to happen with the Falcons. You've got the Braves have won now. The University of Georgia has won, and the Falcons are just kind of meh. Um, I heard somebody the other day, Arthur Blank, uh, the, the billionaire who owns them, that he apparently dabbles too much into stuff instead of leaving the team alone. I don't know whether that's true or not, but certainly people are trying to blame him. He owns the team. He can do what he wants, I guess. But, um, yep, looks like. Sneezing fit. Um, quarterback Matt Ryan is going to the Indianapolis Colts, according to ESPN right now. Looks like uh, it'll be done before the end of the day. And now <laughs> I see my friend Abby, who's listening out on KRMG in Tulsa, saying, watch Matt Ryan going to pull off a of Stafford and win a Super Bowl now. <laughs> it could be. It could be uh, the, the the Atlanta curse has got to be broken at some point, though, all the way through. In any event, we got other stuff to talk about. The CDC has reduced childhood fatalities from COVID due to a coding error. They say it was computer programming that 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 got the data wrong. Um, now, if you've listened to this program long enough, you know that uh, children have never really been dramatically impacted by COVID. And for a while, it was kind of crazy. Anyone who pointed out the truth was maligned for daring to point out that truth. The fact of the matter is kids have never been deeply susceptible to COVID. Long COVID, regular COVID, uh, bad COVID, light COVID, they're, just, they're not susceptible to it. They can get it. They're just not going to have bad symptoms. I mean, we, we learned this in our house, our, both of our kids. Uh, got it. We thought it was something else. They both, by the way, tested negative and turned out later uh, that they had had it. But they never, and you know, the vaccines work because Christian and I got the vaccine. We never got sick at all, uh, but the kids did. And Gunner lost his sense of smell, uh, but they, they tested negative. But they weren't really, really bad sick. Uh, none of the kids out there who are, with rare exception, unless they have like morbid obesity and stuff like that, are the kids impacted. And yet the CDC. The, the data was good, even with the numbers, and the CDC had a computer error, and it turns out the data is even better than what the data showed, and the data was pretty good to begin with. And yet again, nobody trusts the CDC. When are we going to have a presidential administration that says, let's just fix the basics of the federal government, because the CDC needs to be fixed? It's 2022. Things are still crazy. Things haven't settled down. And now you got the Federal Reserve and interest rates. You got the economy. You got inflation. A lot of banks won't even return your phone call. Let's say you're a small business and you need a loan for $750,000 or higher. You see an opportunity where banks, they don't even want to see you. You want to buy a building. You want to build a building. Reach out to the Frost family at First Liberty Building and Loan. They've been helping small businesses become big businesses since the 1990s. They want to help you if they can. So spend 10 minutes with them. See if you're a good fit for them and they're a good fit for you. Their website is firstlibertyga.com. That's firstlibertyga.com. Again, you need a loan, $750,000 or higher. You're a small business and you see an opportunity to grow. Share it with the Frost family and see if they can help you. Firstlibertyga.com. That's firstlibertyga.com. First Liberty Building and Loan can help businesses nationwide become bigger businesses. The regular season is heating up. New stars are emerging, and that means more opportunities to win up to 25 times your cash on prize picks. The most exciting way to play daily fantasy sports. Just select two or more players, pick more or less on their projection on a wide variety of stats, and place your entry. It's that easy. Let it fly to turn $10 into $250 with just a few taps. Easy gameplay, quick withdrawals, and injury insurance on your picks are what make Prize Picks the number one daily fantasy sports app. Watch your favorite players and get paid doing it this basketball season. See your entries make progress during the game or make new entries for the second half in the fourth quarter. Three pointers, assists, rebounds, and everything in between are yours for the taking. Join the Prize Picks community of more than 7 million players who have already signed up. 
Right now, Prize Picks will match your first deposit of up to $100. Just download the Prize Picks app and use code GET100. That's code GET100 on Prize Picks for a first deposit match of up to $100. Prize Picks, pick more, pick less. It's that easy.